Um, so our next speaker is the creator and showrunner on the Showcase series Continuum, whose first series was nominated for Best Series by the Saturn Awards, Canadian Screen Awards, Constellation Awards, and Leo Awards. Continuum is currently preparing for a third season, which will air in the spring of 2014. Over the last 20 years, he has sold film and TV projects to Warner, DreamWorks, Universal, Columbia, Working Title, CBS, Fox, FX, TNT, USA, and many independent companies. Feature film credits include the Warner Brothers action thriller, The Art of War, and the micro-budgeted independent Hamlet, which premiered at the 2011 Vancouver International Film Festival. He is a graduate of the UBC Film and Television Degree Program and an industry mentor at the USC Film School. Please welcome Simon Barry. Hi. Um, <clears throat> so showrunners are pretty much in the news these days. Uh, we're kind of like these power brokers of television. <laughs> and um, I've learned a very interesting lesson being a showrunner for the first time is that really power as a TV producer is really all about giving it away. Um, and it's a pretty profound lesson for me because it's really the only way I can do my job on Continuum, which is a big machine and really demanding. Uh, it starts with the writer's room. The one thing you can, I understand really well as a writer is you have to create creative space for yourself, and so creating creative space for others is kind of paramount. And in order to do that, you have to give away control. So immediately starting this position, I realized I had to give away as much control as I could to foster uh, creativity. It starts with planning. This is a sketch of uh, one of the sets we needed for the show, which is a barn. I wrote a barn into the script, and then we started out on this path where this barn actually had to become real. And even though we sketched it out with some talented uh, design artists, the production designer, Chris August, really had to bring it to life. And so we ended up scouting barns, 20, 30 barns. <laughs> There's a lot of barns in the Lower Mainland, apparently. We ended up finding this one in Tawasin, which is great, except it was in Tawasin. <laughs> and we're set in the city of Vancouver, so we really can't drive out to Tawasin as much as we wanted to. So the goal here was to really figure out a way to make it seem real. So what did we do? We built the barn, at least the part of the barn we needed, to match the exterior in a studio in Burnaby. And right away, this is where I started to give away quite a bit of control of what was happening. Uh, a big team of artists, construction people, uh, this giant guy here, um, they all had to sort of start basically taking my initial idea and building it into something that was shootable, real, and that would be uh, part of the framework of the show in a, in a major way. And honestly, the results were way better than I could have ever conceived or even manufactured if I'd been in charge. It was one of the first lessons I learned was that I couldn't do as well as others, and that the goal here, of course, we had to blow it up, because it's TV. <laughs> and um, so, <laughs> that's what you do, you blow shit up. Um, so, now I don't have to deal with it anymore, but the good news is that th the first lesson of this was, I could count on people to really take the vision of the show, and run with it in ways that I, po I probably would never be able to at that level. And that was actually really helpful. It, it also translated to, a, the show takes place in two time frames. Uh, the city of Vancouver in 2077 became a major player as a concept, and Adam Stern at Artifact Studios literally had to design the entire city. I just wrote City Vancouver Future. He actually designed <laughs> every building. There's all these buildings that he actually figured out where they were. And what this afforded was a new way of looking at the storytelling, which I actually hadn't thought of. So by having this virtual 3D city now, it actually inspired new story ideas and new locations that actually had never been part of the original writing process. And so my ability to give this control to another individual, a partner, actually created a whole new series of ideas that would never actually come to life if I hadn't really done that. Um, and as we went through the process, I realized that the more I did this, the better the show would be. Uh, I was basically de-investing myself of this illusion that I thought being a showrunner would be, which was to be kind of this dictator. <laughs> um, and then it translated to things that you know you take for granted, directors and actors. I mean, we had to have John Reardon here look out that window and believe that he wasn't looking at a green thing with a bunch of crew guys standing around. He had to experience this vista. And so 
that kind of collaboration is a whole other transcendent level of, of creativity. This is another example of where we want to do one thing which we can't do in the real world, which is to have this truck almost drive into a train. So Adam built a virtual train. This created a whole new line of storytelling that we probably couldn't have done if we'd used a real train because you'd have to get the insurance and hire the train, which you can't do. It just allowed for much more flexibility. So it all comes together in one shot here. We have props, hair, makeup, wardrobe, visual effects, and of course, Rachel Nichols playing Kira. And all of these things have to happen together, but on their own. I can't manufacture this. Um, no one can. Um, the truth is, everything kind of has to come together together as it does. That goes right down to the level of actors. You write these characters on the page, but they don't come to life on the page. The actors themselves bring that reality when they stand on the set or on location. Marco Rubio. Um, so I'm going to basically um, say that these guys, the actors, Eric Knudsen, they basically took off where I left off in a way that I could never have um, hoped. I mean, it was so much better than I expected. They, were so they gave so much to the characters that they created. And really, another level of this sort of, I didn't have to go up to them ever once and say, oh, this is what it's going to be. They basically ran with it. Music is the last component of, well, the second to last component of, of basically telling the story. A composer like Jeff Dana on Continuum, I had one conversation with him, and now he's done 23 episodes, basically built on his own ideas of what the show is, and has accomplished way more than I could have ever done. Same thing goes in the, in the last stages of post-production when the mix comes together. You can't possibly be in all these places as a showrunner. Uh, there's basically three ring circus happening simultaneously, writing, production, post-production. You have to inspire people to basically do what they want to do, and you hope that they will do it as well as you want it to be. And that's the lesson. The lesson is you don't want to tell people what you want. You want to inspire people to make the show that they want. And if you can do that, you can, you can not only divorce yourself of having responsibilities you could never actually accomplish, you'll actually get a much better product. And at the end of the day, everyone is invested because it's their passion, it's their design. So where does that leave me? Well, I get to take the credit. Um, I don't have to do anything anymore. No, that's not true. But the truth is, um, uh, I get to work in a joyful, uh, lively environment where my friends are my coworkers, and uh, that makes it the best experience you could possibly have. And uh, uh, now Continuum gets to be enjoyed all over the world. This was actually supposed to be the first slide, but yeah. Um, anyway, thank you very much, and um, I appreciate your time.